Welcome everyone. In the previous videos, we introduced this concept of chemical equilibrium and discussed this idea of a dynamic equilibrium where molecules and a reversible reaction are constantly interconverting between reactants and products. We then introduced this topic of the reaction quotient and corresponding equilibrium constant to help quantify this process. In this third video, what we're going to do is take this a step further and actually examine situations in conditions under which you can shift a chemical equilibrium. So specifically, their learning objectives are going to be one, to describe the ways in which an equilibrium system can be stressed or perturbed. How can we change this? And two, we want to be able to predict the response of a stressed equilibrium. And to do that, we're going to use a concept called Le Chatelier's principle. Okay, so to kick things off, remember that chemical equilibrium represent this sort of dynamic balance. We have forward and reverse reactions occurring at equal rates if we've hit equilibrium. Now, what would happen then if we change the reaction rates? And so examples that we could use uh, to change reaction rates could be, for example, the addition of heat, or perhaps you add additional reactants or products. And if you change, if you carry out either one of these, right, we could imagine the reaction rates are going to be changing. So the question we want to ask, if we add heat or if we add reactants or products, is that system still going to be at equilibrium? Okay, so the answer to that is, of course, no. If you stress an equilibrium system by adding either heat or more reactants or products, there will be a net reaction. And that net reaction is going to occur in the direction of greater rate. And of course, this reaction will then proceed in a given net direct, uh, direction until the, re the equilibrium is reestablished, which sums up Le Chatelier's principle. If an equilibrium system is stressed, now by stressed, I mean you could change the concentration, temperature, or changing partial pressure of one of the gases, as we'll see in a, a later, later slide. If you change the equilibrium system in any of these ways, put any of these stressors, the system will experience a shift in response to the stress that reestablishes the equilibrium. So I think one of the most straightforward examples would be if you were to, for example, add reactant. So if you have a reversible reaction here, reactants interconverting with products, if you add more reactant, then this concentration is going to go very high. The rate of the forward reaction is going to increase. And the reaction will shift to the right, creating more product until we use up that excess reactant. And of course, with this will continue to occur, the reaction will shift to the right until equilibrium is reestablished. Conversely, if you add more product, then the reaction will shift to the left uh, in order to use up that additional product. Again, because if you add more product, the rate of the reverse reaction is going to increase. Right? And you'll get that shift to the left again until that chemical equilibrium is reestablished. Now, I think it's worthwhile to, to think a little bit more deeply about how we stress these chemical systems. So remember back in our previous discussions regarding chemical kinetics and rate laws, we saw that according to the rate laws discussion, reaction rates will change with changing concentrations, right? Of course, if you have a first order, second order, uh, you know, reactions that we normally see. Rate, the, according to the Arrhenius equation, the reaction rates themselves will change with temperature. So concentration and temperature are two main factors that we saw previously uh, that impact directly the rates of a chemical reaction. So to see this work out mathematically and implications, let's consider a basic reaction here. We've got H2 and I2 gas coming together to form two. Uh, HI gas molecules, and we're given some equilibrium constant at some specified temperature. All right, so we are going to have a forward and 
reverse rate constant that characterizes the rates of these reactions. And we could write those out again using what we've talked about in our chemical kinetics section. The rate of the forward reaction is gonna depend upon the concentration of those reactants. And again, the powers would be specified through most likely some experimental method. Um, and then of course, similarly, we'd have the rate of that reverse reaction, which will depend upon that concentration of products and the products turning back into reactants. Okay, so you have this rate of the forward, rate of the reverse, and when the system is at equilibrium, of course the rates in the forward and reverse direction will be the same. And so associated um, with this reaction is an equilibrium constant, right? And now we can see this equilibrium constant in two ways now. We can look at it from the standpoint of our definition of Q, that reaction quotient, and saying, okay, well, when Q is no longer changing, what value does it hit? Um, well, that's when you hit equilibrium, and that's going to be our equilibrium constant K, right? We saw this ratio of products over reactants, and again, we're following these um, you know, values that we have here for the stoichiometric coefficients. Now, alternatively, we can now look at this from the vantage point of the equal rates in the forward and reverse directions. If we use our definitions here and plug them in here, we end up with an expression that looks something like this, which we can then set up a ratio of forward over reverse rate constants in terms of concentrations. And with this, uh, of course, will eventually lead us to this same definition. Again, it would require some knowledge of these coefficients or knowledge that we are dealing with elementary reaction steps, which of course give you these uh, exponents. And so with we, when we view the equilibrium constant as this ratio of products and concentrations or forward or reverse rate constants, we want to now look at this expression and consider what will happen if you add more reactant or product. Well, if you add more reactants, and we'll highlight the reactants in blue here, you are then in create, uh, changing this situation so that we would now end up with some Q, right? That where um, Q is, of course, the same form as the equilibrium constant, products over reactants and those concentrations. Now that denominator is going to be larger, which means the rate of the forward reaction is going to be greater than the rate of the react, the reverse. So we will temporarily shift in the forward direction, right? In other words, we will move to the right to reestablish that equilibrium. Another interesting thing to consider here is what would happen if you remove product? Well, it turns out we're gonna see the same effect as above, but the reasons are a little bit different. If we're removing product highlighted in red here, then what we're effectively doing is decreasing this rate of the reverse reaction. So by decreasing the rate of the reverse reaction, by effectively decreasing the concentration of product, you are again going to expect this reaction to uh, proceed shift towards the creation of more products, again, to reestablish that equilibrium. And so really what we're doing here is the same thing we've discussed when we looked at how we can use our reaction quotient, Q, to predict changes in reaction, right? We know that we can define this reaction quotient, Q, and we can compare the relative magnitude of Q and KC to predict which direction a reaction will shift. So in our first example, we of course get a larger denominator. Larger denominator means a smaller QC. So then QC is less than KC and that means the reaction is gonna to shift to the right. Okay, so we wanna take a moment here then and we wanna now consider these concepts in the context of gases, gas phase reactions where we saw that we could express our equilibrium constant or reaction quotient in terms of partial pressures. So if you're dealing with an ideal gas, the partial pressure, P, is directly proportional to the molar concentration, right? And remember, we saw that relationship using our, our good old friend, the ideal gas law. So changes in the partial pressure, P, correspond directly to changes in concentration, N, right? Resulting in the same influence on the equilibrium. Right now, 
So what we're saying here is if we add more gas, we are effectively increasing the partial pressure of that gas. However, and this is a very important point that I see a lot of misconceptions around, is you know when we're dealing with changes in pressure, well, there are many ways that pressure can be changed in ways beyond changing the concentration or partial pressure of a given gas. So to appreciate one of these examples, let's consider our that same reaction, I, H2I2 going to 2HI, all right? Now, we can express this equilibrium constant or reaction quotient in terms of ratio of partial pressures. All right, so now the question that I want to consider is what would happen if you decrease the volume of the container by a factor of three? Would you expect the reaction to either shift to the right, shift to the left, remain unchanged, and you can, of course, choose D and turn off the video if you'd really like to. This is too much. Um, now, what I want you to do is pause things, okay? I want you to pause the video now and make a guess here. Make a guess and try and justify your guess. Okay, so I hope you've had time to think about this for a second here. So the correct answer here is in this situation, we're actually going to be unchanging the, uh, the, the, the chemical equilibrium. So we're not gonna be shifting right or left. We will maintain that same equilibrium. Okay, so if that's a little bit of a surprising result, um, you know that, that's totally fine. What we're gonna do here now is explore how that comes about. And we're gonna use our expression up here just to, to do just that. Okay, so remember in our reaction expression, we have a, a, an expression for our equilibrium constant where we have this ratio of partial pressures. In the problem, we're decreasing the volume of the container by a factor of three. And so we're trying to figure out what's gonna happen to the reaction. Well, decreasing the volume by a factor of three increases the pressure by a factor of three. So we are effectively increasing all of these partial pressures threefold. Now notice, because there are equal number of moles on the reactants and product side, when we plug that threefold increase into each one of the partial pressures, we get a three raised to the second power, which gives us a nine. And then we get another three, another three times three gives us another nine. The nines cancel out and we're actually ending up with the exact same ratio. So because we have an equal number of moles of gas on the left and right hand side of this reaction, we are going to end up with no change in our equilibrium constant. The reaction will not be changing, shifting right or left when we undergo this dramatic increase in pressure. And hopefully this makes sense, right? If, if you're changing partial pressures all by the same amount, reactant and product side, we don't expect to shift. Now, what would happen if we consider another problem where we do have a difference in the number of moles of gas on the left-hand side and right-hand side. So if we look at this example of two molecules of NO2 coming together to form uh, two NO and an oxygen, we see we have two moles and three moles of gas. We have an, uh, um, an associated equilibrium constant expression. And if we do the same thing, decrease the volume by threefold, increase the pressure by threefold, then now these terms don't exactly cancel out. We plug in the three times the partial pressure for all of our terms here, but now we're gonna end up with a Q that is three times bigger than that equilibrium constant. So remember our plot up here, we're starting off somewhere up here now, and Q is a function of T, is Q is gonna change until we reestablish that equilibrium. And let's see, I kind of erased my, label here. This is K. Okay, that's our value of K at the dashed line. So we are going to now see the reaction shift to the left, right? Because we need to, um, we're, we're basically going to be moving in the direction that we are going to be making fewer uh, gas molecules. And so again, if you go back that to Le Chatelier's principle and consider the situation, 
you have a situation where you have more gas on the right, less gas molecules on the left. So if you increase pressure, you're going to shift in the direction that decreases the number of moles of gas so that you effectively undo that increase in pressure. Or at least go in the direction of reversing that change in pressure, I should say. So to summarize this, in situations where there are different numbers of moles of gas on the reactant and product sides, changes in volume will shift the equilibrium. If the volume decreases or increases in the pressure, the equilibrium is going to shift such that there are fewer gas molecules to counter the increase in pressure. If the volume increases or you decrease pressure, the equilibrium shifts to create more gas molecules, again, than to counter the decrease in pressure. Now, there's one more important point I want to make here. And I, I want to use the example that we have on this uh, you know, same slide here. And let's write it out again. I want you to consider a situation where you start off with that reaction. But now, rather than changing the volume, I want to keep the volume fixed and consider what's going to happen if you add some quantity of an inert gas. So fixed volume, but I'm adding more inert gas to this reaction flask. And so once again, I want you to think about, um, yes, we, we are going to be effectively increasing the volume inside that chamber. I, I mean, I, I said, I meant to say, we are gonna be increasing the pressure inside that chamber, but we're not changing the volume. And I want you to pause the video once again here and predict for me, what do you think is going to happen to this equilibrium, the equilibrium of this reaction right here, if you add N2? Is it gonna shift right, left, or remain unchanged? Okay, so hopefully you gave that a little bit of thought. And the answer in this case is nothing. Nothing's gonna change. And the reason for that comes down to our expression for Kp. The expression for Kp is written in terms of partial pressures for each one of the reactant species. If you add more N2 to the reaction flask, yes, this will increase the total pressure. The total, okay? It will increase the total pressure, but it will not increase or change at all, for that matter, the partial pressures of each one of those reactants and product species. Therefore, that equilibrium remains untouched. All right, so with that, we're in a position now to turn our attention to that other side of the coin, that other way that we can stress chemical equilibriums, which are involving temperature changes. And so to explore temperature changes, I want to look at a very simple elementary reaction, a reverse flow reaction involving uh, reactant A and a product B. And we have our associated rate constants. We can write a rate of forward and reverse reactions and then specify that at equilibrium, the rates are gonna be equal. So we have a nice little expression here. Our equilibrium constant can be expressed in terms of the forward or reverse rate constants or that ratio of products over reactant concentrations. Okay, so keeping this in mind, I want you to remember that rate constants themselves the uh, small k r, small k f, f for the forward and reverse rate constants, they're both going to vary with temperature according to the Arrhenius equation. Right? Now, we don't need to jump back in and look at the details of the Arrhenius equation at this point, although you can if you want. Um, but remember that temperature was a very important term in determining the rate of chemical reactions. And so the key part that I want you to remember really boils down to this fact that the rate constants are going to be affected by temperature in different ways, right? And so if they're affected by temperature in different ways, then changes in the temperature will result in a new value of K. The ratio of the rate constants are going to be, it's going to be a different value. And so we have a nice method for predicting uh, equilibria shifts with temperature. And it really boils down to remembering a little bit of our thermochemistry. To predict a shift in equilibrium from temperature, consider that thermochemical equation. In other words, what is the delta H? If you have delta H is positive, right, which remember that would correspond to a endothermic reaction. 
endothermic reaction, then heat can be considered as a reactant. And so you can think of this reaction as heat being added to our reactant to give us product, right? Conversely, if delta H is less than zero, remember that corresponds to an exothermic reaction. And that exothermic reaction is gonna be characterized by uh, some reactants changing into products and some heat evolving or being released by that chemical reaction. Okay, and so writing the chemical reaction that way allows us to use the Chatelier's principle much following the same logic that we did before for concentrations. If we consider uh, one of our favorite equilibrium equations in 2O4 and 2NO gas with this, uh, as written, it will be an endothermic reaction. We can think how we can predict how the equilibrium would shift if the temperatures increase by first following our method and say, hey, look, it's an endothermic reaction, so I'm going to write heat over here as a reactant. If we increase temperature, that's akin to adding more reactant. We're adding more of one of the terms that are showing up on the left-hand side. Therefore, according to Le Chatelier's principle, the reaction will shift to the right towards products to use up the excess, quote, reactant, which is actually heat in this case. We're thinking of heat as being that reactant. Okay, so that sums up our exploration of different ways that we can stress a chemical equilibrium and predict the responses to that stress, namely stresses involving changes in temperature, pressure, um, and concentration of reactants and products. In our next video, we're going to jump into some more detailed calculations involving quantifying how, you, how concentrations will change as a system moves towards equilibrium. That's going to involve a very important concept known as ice tables.